Greetings, everyone. As always, this is Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. This is hopefully going to be a quick video that will introduce you to the topic of metabolism, and future videos will dive into this in more detail. When discussing this topic, it is important to ask the question, what? What exactly do we mean when we say metabolism? The reason we need to talk about the definition is because the word metabolism is something that is often used somewhat incorrectly in our day-to-day -day lives. When we say metabolism, what we are often referring to is how our bodies digest food and burn calories. And to be fair, this is an important part of metabolism. When we eat food, what we are really eating is macromolecules such as proteins, carbohydrates, and so on. Our bodies, and indeed all organisms, break down these macromolecules into subunit molecules. This process also extracts energy from the food. This is what most people think of when they think of metabolism, but in fact, this is only half of the story. What is shown here is actually referred to as catabolism, the first half of metabolism. Now, I should pause here to mention something else. Energy and subunit molecules are not the only thing extracted during catabolism. Electrons are also extracted from the food, and in some ways the electrons are the most important part of this process. Or, at the very least, we will make a big deal about these electrons during Biology 112 lecture. Moving on, the second half of metabolism involves taking the energy, electrons, and subunit molecules and combining them into new macromolecules that the organism needs. This half of metabolism is known as anabolism. Eventually, every organism becomes food for another organism, and the cycle repeats itself. Let's now return to the electrons for a moment since I mentioned them as being important. Metabolism is a long series of chemical reactions occurring inside organisms. Since we are also dealing with the transfer of electrons, we must therefore be dealing with reactions that involve reduction and oxidation. In other words, metabolism is very much about redox reactions. Now most students get a bit nervous when they hear the term redox reactions, and I understand why. Often, someone's first experience with redox reactions is confusing, trying to balance atoms, oxidation numbers, and electrons. Thankfully, we can keep it quite streamlined here in Biology 112. For us, the primary redox reactions involve a sugar molecule such as glucose. In the presence of oxygen, glucose can burn, producing carbon dioxide and water. Inside organisms, this isn't really burning per se, but rather a series of controlled reactions we call aerobic respiration. This is something we will explore during Biology 112. The glucose molecule is broken down over many steps, and the electrons from glucose are transferred to the oxygen molecules to form water. In other words, the glucose is oxidized to form carbon dioxide, and the oxygen is reduced to form water. Note that life can also do the backwards reactions as well where carbon dioxide is reduced to form sugar molecules and water is oxidized to form oxygen. Again, electrons are transferred, but this time in the opposite direction. The most notable example of these reactions occurs during photosynthesis, which is also something we will explore during Biology 112. By the way, you may have noticed that we are missing something important from both reactions, and that is energy. Energy is released during the oxidation of glucose and this energy is harnessed by cells. On the flip side, energy is required for the reduction of carbon dioxide. As you likely already know, this energy is supplied by light during photosynthesis, notably from sunlight. Now let me finish up by talking a bit more about redox reactions involving carbon. The most reduced form of carbon is methane, and the most oxidized form is carbon dioxide. In between these two, carbon can adopt a whole range of partially reduced and oxidized forms, some of which are shown here as an example. If we wanted, we could calculate the oxidation state of the highlighted carbon atom. Understanding the relative oxidation state for any given carbon atom is important for what we will discuss during lecture. Thankfully, we can simplify this quite a bit for Biology 112. 
Notice that as the carbon becomes more oxidized, it tends to gain more bonds to oxygen atoms. In fact, this is where the name oxidation came from. Other atoms can replace oxygen for oxidizing carbon, but for us here in Biology 112, we don't need to worry about that. On the flip side, notice that the more reduced forms of carbon have more bonds to hydrogens. In other words, if you observe a carbon gaining more bonds to oxygens during a reaction, it has been oxidized. Conversely, increasing the number of bonds to hydrogens means that the carbon has been reduced. This is the trend we will use here in Biology 112. With this in mind, we can look again at the methane and carbon dioxide and compare them to glucose. Notice that the glucose carbons are neither fully oxidized nor reduced. Moving towards carbon dioxide is oxidation, and moving more towards methane would be reduction. We will talk about how these trends apply to living cells in detail during Biology 112 lectures. Okay, well, this video has already gone on longer than I hoped, so let me wrap up by saying we will spend two to three weeks in class discussing the various aspects of metabolism and the redox reactions that are involved. In future videos, I will introduce some of these redox reactions and processes in more detail.